Joining me now from London is Arise Business Analyst Bode Oshasami. Thank you for coming on Business Week as usual. Great to have you. Thank you. We're all lucky. Yeah, so at the top of the show, I referred to Tinubunomics, which is the policy ethos of the current president and the current government. So what are your thoughts on how his reform trajectory is going? What, what do you make of everything that has happened? And it's been a whole laundry list of activity. Well, certainly there's a lot of optimism that has been uh, revived, especially in Nigeria. Nigeria has moved from barely investable to going back on the radar for investors. And um, of course, I do want to repeat everything that has been said. But uh, if you understand the, the issues at stake, um, we are really beginning to address things that we should have done decades ago. But um, yes, that, of course, is important. You need to do that. But to get to where you want to go, uh, you have to understand that there are opportunities to reap gains uh, from a leadership that can leapfrog over decades of decay and uh, win what looks to me like a, a recovery marathon requiring razor focus, vision, transparency, integrity, competence, and, well, of course, inclusivity in the context of the tribal cleavages that, that we have, getting a cohesion and progress that can take Nigeria to where it needs to be. Many are now saying if you compare Nigeria to, to South Africa, for example, that Nigeria seems to now have uh, momentum on its side to be able to make uh, progress, given that uh, its issues are more linked uh, to policy mismatches, misalignments, and or implementation, things mm. that can be addressed, of course, uh, consistently o over time, uh, much unlike um, South Africa, which has much more complex issues in terms of the legacy of, uh, of, of um, uh, apartheid. But um, having said that, it's a start, and um, a start, of course, is not as important, as you know, in, in a marathon, a stamina, a strategy, a stain on focus, and I think that's what um, uh, many are, of course, watching. Yes, indeed. And of course, we've seen quite a lot of policy pronouncements, but one of the latest ones that I think came out yesterday was this new circular from CBN saying that it had reviewed downwards the cash reserve ratio requirements for merchant banks. So we're seeing a lot of changes in financial services and monetary policy. What impact is that likely to have on the financial services industry? Well, like everything else, it's critical that um, you restore confidence, build trust, ensure policy alignment, consistency. We need to know what you're doing. And um, it seems this government is prioritizing economic growth above inflation. Uh, with new focus to improve food supply and the bottlenecking, the bottle, the, the, the issues there, hoping to get inflation under control more by supply side uh, reform. Mm. On the cash reserve ratio, we know why that was quite high. 32.5% uh, has gone down to 10% for merchant banks, and that was to uh, tighten uh, the, the monetary environment to uh, get inflation uh, under control. But demand side, Tightening didn't work so well, given the supply chain issues and the fact that Nigeria has a high informal sector outside the formal uh, banking influence. So relaxing CRR for merchant banks will free more domestic capital for the private sector, which may not be as inflationary, especially if this is backed with a needed but less popular and unlikely initiative to drastically reduce the cost and size of public sector inflationary spend. It's so obviously wasteful. If a former governor rejected his pension from a state government since he's already receiving uh, something from the National Assembly. So there, there are things you need to do to get inflation under control. The, the suspended central bank governor also reiterated that based on its models and situation, inflation would have been significantly worse if not for its uh, extra tight monetary policy, which is now being relaxed. But I think the bigger picture is we need to get growth. Nigeria has many strategic competitive advantages. Some of them were highlighted at a recent conference on Thursday, but a lot of work needs to be done to be sure that everything works together for, for because it's, it's the fit mm. that really matters. Everything working in the same direction, the synergies, the alignment, and you don't have have things going in different uh, uh, ways. One thing, I let me just mention a few things that was said, I think, at that CEO conference. The, the Shell CEO, uh, Osagi Okumbo, he said that, yes, investor investment can come in, but security remains an issue. 
contracts can still take over three years. In other words, little has changed in the details, in, in the trenches. And I think that's what, where the work needs to be done. More work needs to be done in, in ensuring that the micro level processes are enabled with digitization, training, change management, so that we get the change. Policy, yes, is important, but um, micro level change is also key. Then of course, Nigerian businesses are impatient. They want a larger vision than what is being offered. Doing what we should have done a decade ago, a decade ago is to be applauded, but it's it's not enough to get there. And and of course, just like I said, in a marathon, the fast start is less important than staying power, aligning your strategy properly. And of course, uh, uh, carrying people along is going to be very important in the Nigerian context. As you know, Nigeria is, is, is a very complex society, various yeah. interests. So you really have to spend time with entrepreneurs to hear what the issues are and uh, test out some of these ideas with mm. them and get their feedback and and have this process that, that continually uh, gets the improvement that you want. So, but um, I think the vision needs to be much, much, much bigger. I, I recommend that you listen uh, to the speech by uh, Adishino, Dr. Adishino at the CEO conference. I think this government may be mis, uh, how would I put it, underestimating what needs to be done, the size of, of the dream that people want uh, for Nigeria to get us to where we, we need to be. Yes, indeed. I, I've seen the script of that speech and I, I do intend to read it. But I, I had one final question for you. Is Tinubunomics, as it's been coined, really about free market policies? Is it about liberal economic policies? Is, is, should that be our expectation going forward? Well, I think there's a bit of pragmatism, of course, that is needed, apart from just um, dwelling on ideology. But um, uh, clearly, you can see that his positioning as the the market-friendly or the market-oriented mm. um, lead, much unlike the, the other leader. But there are practical issues like attracting FS, FX uh, to boost the supply gaps, practical issues like lifting capital controls, doing what, the, all that's needed, and then to restore confidence uh, when they see you as uninvestable, it's a serious issue. So to yeah. get back now, it's we're in a wait and see mode, and um, to get back is going to take a lot of effort. So I think it's on. He's on the right track, no doubt. But um, the, the stamina to continue at this pace is something that definitely will depend on the, the ministers who yes. puts together the mm. team, and then what happens when the initial cracks, as will always uh, happen. Uh, uh, are exposed, we have the courage to take the tough decisions, especially in things like corruption, which we know are very, very serious um, uh, headwinds uh, to uh, in a Nigerian growth scenario. Yes, thank you very much for your views on that, uh, Mr. Oshasami. So let's move on to other markets. In the US and the UK, actually, two jurisdictions, we've seen this kind of back and forth between regulators and Microsoft uh, on its bid to acquire a gaming company, Activision Blizzard. What do you make of the latest court uh, pronouncement saying, I mean, the court, actually, the regulator lost its appeal. Does that mean it's, it's smooth sailing for the merger ahead? <laughs> Well, they're calling it a black eye for the <laughs> U.S. Federal Trade uh, Commission. If you look at the contest, you, it's probably 3-2 now in favor of Microsoft. There <laughs> yes. are now two court orders in the U.S., the lower court and the higher court. And, of course, the EU, making the third, uh, well, strong voice that has spoken for this. While on the other side, you still have the U.S. Federal Trade Commission uh, licking uh, her wounds and the uh, U.K. Uh, Competition Market Authority trying to decide how to move uh, forward. But um, my, my sense is that the UK regulators uh, can sk still scuttle or delay the deal. There's a July 18 deadline looming. Uh, Microsoft has offered to sell off the, the cloud-based market rights uh, in the UK for games in the UK as a remedy to address CMA uh, concerns, but that may require a fresh review. UK regulators very well uh, I think they were they were good to say that they are going to do the reviews as quickly as possible, and um, a final order will come before the end uh, of August. But um, I think if you look at uh, how markets are, are looking at um, Activision Blizzard now, 
uh, after uh, yesterday, the shares were up 3.36% after closing at 0.59%. So clearly, everybody thinks this deal is moving forward. But there's politics as well. Lena Khan, that's the progressive head of the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, is accused of mismanaging the FTC, politicizing rule makings and pushing and and to merger and to big business agenda by the Republican-led House Committee that put her through some tough questioning last week. So, yes, yesterday's ruling against her is another blow to the FTC and its chair. But in the UK, Chancellor Hunt has said he will not interfere. But it's hard to see how the UK, desperate to be seen as the place to do business, will snub off uh, Microsoft, even as um, Microsoft and Activision are openly plotting how they can move forward legally uh, with or without uh, the UK. So let's see what happens. But the FTC is still in, in the US, they may still have some options up their sleeve. For your, for your views on that, and we'll be watching that space closely. Now, we've had the U.S. inflation figures come out. We've also obviously had the bank earnings season uh, results also come out. What do you make of this? We saw the impact on equity markets, which was positive. Uh, let's hear your thoughts on, you know, whether this will mean no rate hikes again <laughs> or whether we shouldn't get carried away. Well, it's early, although they are calling it the celebration of uh, disinflation. That's what the headlines are, are, are calling it. The dollar sank to a new two-month low. Yes, inflation went down, not just CPI. We also got PPI, that's the, the factory gates inflation, which is typically predictive of the next in the CPI prints also uh, being very, very um, low, very soft. The good news is that some of the tough areas, services, housing and food inflation, are coming uh, down. And um, uh, analysts, although they say the Fed rate rise trajectory is not likely to be affected at the next meeting, a definite rate rise will still come. But um, what happens after that will perhaps depend more on, on maybe the data that we get um, after this one. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, because we, we're almost running out of time, I don't want us to miss a chance to talk about this story that has been in the news here with capital markets in Niger, with the move by the Honeywell investment uh, company, Barbican Capital, to acquire additional shares in FBN Holdings. And then CBN, I think there was a, a pronouncement about you know investors needing approval if they want to acquire uh, more than 5% of a share in the bank. It's really interesting. Investors are not taking it too kindly, all this rumblings and, and squabbles between shareholders <laughs> of a big bank. What do you make of all this? Innocent, uh, yield-seeking investor or something a bit more political? Well, I'll try to be very, very quick. My summary is that we should keep encouraging private sector endeavor and domestic and global investments to support a positive sentiment in markets, despite these conflicts. They're not necessarily bad. Yeah. As long as they have a process uh, to handle them, they're inevit inevitable, just shows human beings are, are involved in, in running these companies. Uh, processes, if they're in place, it's fine. But there are three points I'll just quickly mention. Nigerian companies don't need a lecture on board governance. The prime role of the board chair is to act and referee, if necessary, in the overall best interest of the company, which can conflict to the agenda of increasingly active uh, dominant shareholders. And um, of course, the increasing role of independent directors is important. Effective use of board committees, all very important. Standards on ethics need to be higher. Insider deals need to be shunned. Recusal mm. of board participants from decisions in which they could have potential interest. All these are already known. Second, my guess is that we could get better outcomes in the financial services industry. The structure of supervision in Nigeria can be improved. It may help, for example, if we have a financial conduct authority working in collaboration with the central bank, of course, but not in the central bank. Mm. This is the UK model. In the US, they have a financial stability oversight council under the treasury and office of controller of the currency and consumer financial protection, both outside the Fed. So there are checks and balances here and there. And what this will do is allow the CBN to focus better on potential regulation and administer much more comprehensive uh, tests uh, to expose potential cracks long before they, they, they manifest. Many of the issues in First Bank were very historical. They should have been uncovered in uh, long, long ago, in my view. And then, of course, if you have a separate financial conduct authority like they have in the UK, you can get better uh, focus on competition, 
fair outcomes. During, for example, currency change, many instances of deplorable conduct uh, from banks and a lot of anecdotal, anecdotal evidence of taking advantage of customers, that needs special focus. So, yes, potential regulatory monitoring is important, financial conduct is important, and there is also need for, for checks and balances. Finally, First Bank is now in better health, we hear. And no more needs central bank and holding. The process needs to be quickly initiated to hand over governance to shareholder appointed directors yeah. and withdrawal of uh, CBN appointed directors should be immediately initiated. Of course, this will be contingent on an accord that the main stakeholders to imbibe highest standards of governance in the best interest of the bank and strictest ad adherence uh, to best practice standards in nomination of directors for the bank. So all this is based on a helicopter view, but... Um, Conflicts like this should help us make progress if we learn and uh, make the required adjustments. Yes, and in, in fact, it, it would be really about the lessons learned. We've also heard that the government may actually move to that sort of structure where it removes some oversight function from the CBN and creates an independent regulatory authority. So we'll watch that. I'm told we still have a couple of minutes. And so I wanted you to touch on the U.S. bank result. It seems like the recent interest rate highs have benefited them uh, insofar as their net interest income readings are concerned. What do you make of some of the results that have been in the market so far? Well, yes, indeed. Rising interest rates helped the major lenders, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. Of course, JP Morgan was also helped by acquisition of Republic Bank. They got a bit from, from there. Uh, but of course, investment banks slowed down. The deal activity slowed down. A lot of corporate uh, banking, uh, capital market uh, uh, transactions slowed down. And that uh, hit uh, Citigroup, which didn't have as much a, uh, of a lending side to offset the law in, that we saw in deals. Profitability was, was also hit by elevated costs driven by inflation. Uh, with some going through expensive restructuring and layoffs like Citibank. And then we also saw credit losses or provisions up with slowdown in loan growth and uh, rising costs related to commercial real estate uh, debt. That was in Wells Fargo uh, and, and JP Morgan. Another pattern that was showing is the draining of liquidity in the global uh, banking system. Despite acquiring um, First Republic, JP Morgan actually saw lower deposit. And we are seeing this wider uh, banking sector flight to uh, safety in, in terms of um, uh, deposits or looking for better yield, which you know, favors, of course, the bigger banks like JP Morgan. But JP Morgan was a bellwether for US banking sector. They beat at both top and bottom line. Of course, um, the, the perception of safety, I think, helped them. Their earnings came in up 72% from last year. Revenue came in up 34%, uh, up 21% if you if you exclude uh, for First uh, Republic, although they had to uh, take uh, more uh, loan loss uh, pro provisions. Wells Fargo also did quite well. Citigroup struggled a bit. So we saw uh, a drop in, in, in most of their income lines, definitely because uh, it, it's a quarter where marked by a fear of recession to some extent. And this um, lull in corporate spending and uh, the costly round of layoffs also hit uh, Citigroup. But they're still able to do uh, better uh, than they had initially estimated. If you look at the stocks in terms of um, the, the banks, um, Wells Fargo did better than, than, than all the others, although JP Morgan was also positive for a while. But I think markets are also looking at the headwinds, and uh, although some are saying which recession, when you look at these huge, huge windfalls, mm. that these banks are, st are still making. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing those insights. Really enjoyed hearing your, your take on the U.S. bank results. We'll be watching more results being released in the coming weeks.